Again, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Arn Finalstrup. I'm the global head of the uh, KCS Academy, and that's the training and certification arm of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And so, welcome to our KCS Aligned and Verified Vendor Series. So, in this series, you get to hear KCS best practices from experts from our Aligned and Verified Vendors, and often their community in this case, uh, GeoTab. And for those not familiar with our KCS Aligned and Verified uh, program, it's a, a very specialized elite group of tools that support the KCS practices. So in the case of our verified vendors, so these are the verified vendors um, would be more of the, the knowledge-based systems, um, CRMs, et cetera. They've demonstrated they support all eight KCS practices. Our line vendors are more specialized, such as search tools and, um, enterprise search, uh, and uh, they have proven that they support elements of the KCS methodology. And this webinar is sponsored by Search Unify, so they're one of our KCS Align vendors. And I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Daniel Miller and Brian Cochran. So Brian is the Regional Sales Manager at Search Unify, and Daniel is the KCS Program Analyst at GeoTab. And, uh, known these folks for quite a while. They both have over a decade of TCS experience. Um, and I had the pleasure actually of personally working with Daniel on leveraging TCS uh, to drive service excellence at a prior job. And I can certainly vouch for him as a expert TCS practitioner. Um, and gathering insights from all of your service touch points um, is just so critical to improving that service experience. So whether it be shifting left, moving to lower cost and lower customer effort channels, or ultimately improving the products, um, touching into those customer uh, insights, the VOC is so critical. So looking forward to all of the insights Daniel and Brian are gonna be sharing today. But um, some housekeeping before we begin. So this session is being recorded and will be posted on our site as well as sent out to all who have registered. And this is a public video. So we encourage you to share it um, with your colleagues. Um, but please put yourself on mute and put, um, put your questions in chat. So we're gonna have representatives from both Search Unify and GeoTab, and they're gonna be monitoring the chat. They'll either answer them in chat, they'll bring them up to Brian and Daniel in the flow is appropriate, or we're saving for the Q&A session at the end. We'll have some time at the end for the Q&A. Uh, but we also wanna make sure you're aware of upcoming uh, KCS Academy events. So Jennifer Morcat, she's our community success manager. So she's gonna be posting the link in the chat for our events page for all the upcoming events. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Brian and Daniel. All right, thank you so much, Arnfin. Um, before we get into the, the conversation, um, I'm just gonna give a very, very quick overview on Search Unify, and then we'll jump right into um, the core of the presentation. So uh, for everybody um, joining, whether you're a Search Unify client or just learning about Search Unify, we are a cognitive technology platform that's built on, um, on a foundation of cognitive search, uh, machine learning, and an insights engine. So we are really focused on helping connect customers with content to solve more known issues on their own. Also have some intelligent routing when there are unknown issues that require agent um, investigation. And really putting those together, we're focused on helping improving the quality and capacity of your customer support and self-service engagement. So in terms of who is it for, you know, Search Unify clients, whether it's um, support agents and TSEs, knowledge workers, community managers, biz operations, customer success, or even self-service users, you know, all of them have a part in terms of how Search Unify is being leveraged or how you're taking analytics from Search Unify to make better informed decisions. In terms of why you use it, um, so elevating self-service engagement, you can fill content gaps to, you know, again, close the, close the distance between, you know, the voice of your content and the voice of your customer. And really that relates to enhancing content findability. On um, the agent side, we can drive case resolution and knowledge reuse. Um, we can focus on capturing knowledge and creating knowledge directly within the workflow. And also for those cases that come in where you know, we need to do some intelligent triage and, and sentiment analysis and case routing, Search Unify also supports that. So in terms of why all of this is important, well, it's because the proliferation of features that companies continue to develop for their customers is vastly outpacing their capability to, to consume them. So, you know, one thing that we traditionally control, um, you know, from our perspective as knowledge, as knowledge workers is content. Now, creating knowledge is a byproduct of those customer interactions. But even if we publish an answer to every question that comes into the contact center, 
it doesn't necessarily mean or guarantee that our customers are going to find it. And this is why we tend to see, you know, um, certain support organizations tend to be flooded with lower level how-to configuration and install use cases. And really, there's no, there's no better indication in terms of how your customers are succeeding or failing with your content than if you are seeing these types of cases. So according to industry research, up to 61% of these um, cases that are, that are requiring agent assistance are how-to configuration and install use cases. So if we think about you know, the implication of seeing these repeatable solvable issues within the contact center, up to 40% of a company's expenses on average can be spent compensating for that weak digital customer experience. And if we think about, you know, practitioners like Geotab, this is a story and an experience that they know through and through. They've seen this every single day with their KCS program. And if you look at how they have evolved their content to meet customer demand, it's actually trending in that how-to configuration and install direction. And what's really interesting about these, and if you think about it, um, these really happen to be issues that every single customer faces on that path to value realization and adoption. So one of the key areas that Geotab and no doubt other fellow consortium members have really leveraged to deliver on their customer promise is doing a deeper analysis on the customer journey and content gaps to really inform their CX efforts. And apparently this is only being done by up, upwards of 6% of companies today. So from a KCS methodology perspective, we understand that the capability to execute on these key responsibilities and driving improvements is led by the knowledge domain expert or the KDE. So knowledge domain experts, as we know, they are critical to evolve loop success. They're focused on the specific domain of content, responsible for looking after the health of the KDE. They really focus on building relationships outside of support with folks like product management. And it, it's pretty critical that they have some technical expertise in the domain and also a profound understanding of KCS. And so when we think about KDE jobs to be done, we often look to key benefits such as improving the quality of our knowledge and self-service effectiveness um, through, through Evolve Loop content. But there are other benefits, and we will certainly be covering some of these today, such as driving new product offerings with product management and marketing teams, um, creating new user applications uh, with application engineers, um, improving company policies. And Geotab has actually expanded their business capabilities and coverage based on the feedback they got from their customers in this regard. It's very interesting there. And then also improvement of products and services. So whether development, product management teams, taking those insights to you know, create better customer outcomes, the most important place, which is using your products and services. So if we look at the bigger picture and in order to achieve the outcomes that we just discussed, uh, there's a variety of challenges to implement a sustainable KDE program. For instance, how do I accurately assess contributions to a particular domain? I don't really have the tools to review findability and accuracy of the most frequently used articles. Or I might be sitting in spreadsheets trying to figure out you know, how effective my content is being reused by my agents. And also looking at limited insights um, in terms of performing that root cause analysis and taking corrective action. So given all of this and the opportunities and challenges to drive successful outcomes from the KDE, I'd like to introduce you to someone who knows a lot more about driving success in this particular, particular role than I do. And that's my friend, Daniel Miller from GeoTap. And so Daniel, as, as Arnfin was alluding to, has over 20 years of experience in technical training, KM and customer support. Uh, Daniel used to work with Arnfin, Patrick McBride, and some of the other folks from Oracle and joined GeoTap in 2019. And over the last few years that he's been there, he has developed and can, continues to evolve a very extremely successful KDE program. So, you know, he has a very interesting perspective on, you know, how to leverage the right mix of people, process, and technology, and developing that optimal approach to scaling Evolve Loop success. Um, so really focusing on being where your customers are with the knowledge to help them succeed, and also making product improvements based on those interactions. So Daniel, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, all yours. Okay. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I got to tell you, it's great to be here and it's great to see so many familiar names in the participant list. Um, I would like to start off to talking a little bit about what Geotab does, if you don't mind. Um, Geotab is a proven leader when it comes to the Internet of Things and connected transportation. See, what we do is we securely connect commercial vehicles to the cloud and then provide data driven analytics to help these businesses better manage their fleets and make data-driven decisions. Geotab's motto is management by measurement. And uh, one thing that's really 
kind of unique about GeoTab is that we have an open platform solution. We have a whole network of partners that create add-ons to the GeoTab functionality and then also use our data to help their own business operational needs. And it doesn't matter what size of the company it is, um, they all have access to the entire pool of data. Um, so as you can see on the slide, uh, we do have our six key focus areas. We wanna help companies be productive and part of being productive is optimizing your fleet. And also looking at the data, you can help improve the safety of your fleet. Um, a really simple example of this is, do you have some semi trucks that are trying to back up? For a semi trailer, this is a very unsafe practice. And so you wanna be aware of it. Um, we help companies adhere to the nation's compliance laws. And we wanna make sure that everything is expandable to grow with the company. Um, and lastly, we also keep sustainability in mind. Geotab is one of the companies that truly believes that it's up to all of us to kind of take care of our big blue marble. Now, here's an example of what happens with the data from Geotab. Um, Las Vegas, Nevada had a problem with semis clogging up their city streets while doing deliveries. And this happened during the day. Okay. Now, utilizing the data gathered by Geotab regarding truck movement, Las Vegas was able to reschedule their stoplights to improve traffic flow during the day. And they, they switched the lights over to another schedule in the evening and nighttime. Okay. Uh, Brian, you're Brian, on. you're on mute too. Uh, my apologies, Daniel. Just thinking about Las Vegas, for example, and I really appreciate that overview. You know, I've gone to conferences there for at least the last 10 years. And, you know, especially over the last few years, I've really noticed that during the daytime, you know, it's, it's a lot more efficient in terms of, you know, not seeing Las, Be Las Vegas Boulevard completely backed up at Gridlock. So uh, I think I've kind of, in, kind of inherently noticed the, the, you know, the benefit Geotab's driven. Um, in terms of um, kind of setting up our, you know, the rest of our conversation, now, could you tell us a little bit more about your KDE program at Geotab and kind of how you set that up and, you know, if there's any differences compared to what somebody would expect behind a KDE program? Sure. Um, like you alluded to, um, our KDE setup is not a regular one, okay? Um, we have product KDEs that are from Tier 2 and Tier 3 support. We call them partner support and engineering support. These are the people that focus on our products and services, and they do most of the analytics work. They're also, they have the deepest knowledge of our products, okay? Uh, we also have our process and procedure KDEs, and this sub-team is made up of team leads, and they make sure that all of the internally facing content is correct. Um, for example, if a customer wants to check on an order and they call in to support, that's not the normal avenue that that inquiry would happen through. And so we have an article that support agents can query that explains how to handle that type of a call. And that's what the process and procedure KDEs handle, is that type of content. Um, we also have our deputy KDEs. Now, these are from our tier one customer support. Most of them work the night shift when there's a lot less customer traffic volume. And what they do is they handle a lot of the article feedback. Um, if there's any feedback that they can't handle, then they contact the product KDEs. They also recommend articles for archiving. Uh, they look for duplicate articles and then combine those uh, to help get rid of the duplicates. And then they also help um, the KDEs as needed. So sometimes we get special requests coming in uh, that the uh, product KDEs may not be able to handle yes. right away and we pass those yes. off to the deputy KDEs. Okay. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that all of our KDEs have the capability to produce resolution guides, all right? If you're not familiar with resolution guides, those are where you take a single topic that might have multiple resolutions and you reference all of those articles in one uh, parent article, one parent document. Okay. So some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today are displayed on the screen. Um, a lot of these are gonna look very familiar to you. 
And you might be wondering, okay, why are we talking about the same old, same old? Well, we're not. What we're doing is we're talking about these topics, but from a different perspective. We're going to be looking at them as part of the voice of the customer. All right. So the first topic that will bring us to you, Daniel, thank you so much for, uh, for taking that one, is uh, incorporating the voice of the customer into the evolution of the content standards workflow. So why don't we go ahead and start there? Right. Okay. So um, now that uh, you see that we're how we're set up, let's kind of dive down into the more granular aspects. Um, the KDEs have to focus on particular domains, which means that you have to have a content tagging strategy. This allows you to do a Pareto analysis, a Pareto analysis against particular data categories. Now, up until now, GeoTab has relied on humans to do the tagging, right? And it's worked quite well. Right? But in the very near future, we're going to be employing machine learning to help identifying better tags. All right. Uh, the reason why we are doing this is to incorporate customer product usage, uh, their search habits. Uh, feedback on articles, community posts that they do. Um, we're going to incorporate all of those different avenues into our tagging to make our content more findable. And this is all voice of the customer response. Okay. Now, as it's already come up, uh, I used to work at Oracle. And one of the big complaints there, and quite frankly, at other companies uh, that I've spoken with, is that sometimes people have a hard time finding the good content amongst the content that is not specifically relevant to them, all right? Um, Oracle had over one and a half million articles in their knowledge base. And you might be thinking, okay, we only have 10,000 articles or we only have 5,000 articles. Okay? Geotab, we have about 8,500 articles right around in there, okay? So we don't have to worry about this, right? No, actually it doesn't really matter the size of your knowledge base. Uh, it's still important to maintain a healthy knowledge base. And so for that reason, it's important to have a content archival strategy. Uh, for example, Geotab, what we do is we look at articles that haven't been linked to any cases for over a year, all right? Um, and also they have less than 10 views in the past year. Uh, we don't look at new articles. They have to have been created a year or more uh, ago, okay? Um, now these are reviewed to see if, uh, uh, they need to be archived. And this is one of the tasks that the deputy KDEs uh, do. And if they do find candidates for archiving, then what they do is they contact uh, uh, the product uh, KDEs or uh, my coworker, Ben, myself. By the way, a call out to Ben. He's on the chat. He's going to be addressing any questions that come in from that direction. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, now, all of this is on top of our regular knowledge maintenance wo uh, workflow, also known as, guess what, the solve loop. <laughs> um, it's important to have an overall content management life cycle to look at potential changes to your overall strategy. For example, okay, if you are still collecting, are, are you still collecting the correct metadata? So maybe your customers keep asking a question like, is this relevant to my version of the product? So you decide you need to add a version to your articles. This is all integrating the customer's perspective and context. Literally, your customers are trying to talk to you in the way that they interact with your content and which content they are interacting with. Can you go to the... Cool. Um, at Geotab, we do do a, a quarterly Pareto analysis, and it's focused on the quality of the top 20% of our articles of each domain. Okay. Um, as you know, every reuse is a review, but we still double check our highest value articles to make sure that they remain as close to the content standard as possible. Now, the deputy KDEs mo do most of the work in the long tail, as I already talked about, they, they look for duplicates. And uh, this is done on a more continuous basis because we do have new hires and they're new to the KCS program. And so sometimes they end up creating duplicate content while they're learning the KCS methodology. So now one of the loudest voices from the customer is how they use your content, right? Is your company avoiding cases 
because customers were able to find the content indicating that you have a good self-service experience. That is what we want to see. Okay? On the other hand, do they view the article online but still connect to support to open a case indicating that the content was not sufficient to solve? You recognize the KCS buzz phrases here, okay? Um, do they view the content online and still log a lot of cases for that topic? Maybe you're just missing content and you have content gaps. These are all ways that your customers are trying to communicate with you and tell you where their pain points are. Okay? Now, some companies try to rely exclusively on things like surveys and customer usability groups as the totality of their voice of the customer. But the thing about those avenues is that they're skewed simply due to the fact that there are certain types of customers that participate in these types of events. The data from your search engine is not biased. And therefore, it's actually a much better voice of the customer. And Daniel, I think that that's incredibly interesting because what we've seen, especially over the last couple of years and working with fellow KCS practitioners and the, the, you know, the more involvement customer support and the more involvement customer success has is, okay, search is becoming you know, that leading indicator for churn, right? Not, not just disconnects within the content experience, but you know, kind of looking at that, that in, kind of looking at all those disconnects and what will it lead to? And most, most likely it's going to be a lack of value realization and ultimately churn. Um, so if we go on to the next, the, uh, the next slide and the, and the next part, uh, we'll talk now about plugging in those voice of content driven content gaps. Um, so voice of the customer driven content gaps and self-service. So, uh, Daniel, let me go ahead and pass it back to you. For this one. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, so companies, especially companies new to the KCS process really need to utilize the information returned by their zero search result reports. Okay. Um, search Unify has them. Uh, other search engines also have those. And you need to take a look at those um, to see what contents are look uh, that users are looking for, but it doesn't exist yet. All right. Um, your customers are, are literally talking to you on this. Um, when I first started at Geotab, about 14% of our searches resulted in zero search results. That was terrible. Okay. Uh, now it's down to around 4%. Uh, when I worked at Oracle, it was pretty uh, consistent at 7%. Okay. Um, as the KCS program matures, this is less valuable for mature products. Right? You're just not going to see that as many content gaps this route. However, when you have new product introductions or substantial changes to existing products, then you're going to start seeing these zero search result uh, reports becoming very valuable again. Okay. Um, if content exists and customers are still logging cases, that is an indication that the content is not findable and either the article needs to be tuned or boosted by the capabilities within Search Unify. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So besides the zero search result report, um, are customers having to scroll through more than one page of information, right? There's kind of a, a thing about the internet. If it doesn't appear on the first page, customers just aren't going to find it. Very few people scroll to the next page, right? But uh, when people are going to your website, if they're not finding something on the first page and they're advancing to the next page, um, you need to take a look at this, right? This can happen when you have a lot of similar content. For example, maybe you have two different products, but the language is very similar between them, right? Um, so that can kind of muddy the waters a little bit. But just because the content is similar doesn't mean they're duplicates, right? So it has to stay there. So it's necessary to spend time on improving findability. Daniel, this is a report that you know stands out to me because you know, like you said, if we're if we're searching on Google and trying to find best chocolate chip cookie recipe, maybe we won't go very far. But if it's a mission critical product that I use as part of my business, you know, I'm going to go multiple pages to find the right information. So not only just the the dead ends, but where are customers giving you that insight that they actually found something valuable, and how can you close that gap? 
So I'll go ahead and pass it right back to you. For this. All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, so if they're going on to page two, page three, page four, okay, one of the ways that you can help correct this is by creating resolution guides and boosting those, right? Um, again, I explained a little bit about resolution guides before the, the, the uh, KCS certification content can really lay that out for you. So I'm not gonna dive any deeper into it, um, but determining which articles to boost is a very critical part of the KDE work, right? It's quite often the KDE ends up creating evolve loop content that should always show up first given a particular word or phrase um, used in the search, right? Now, while it's very important, it's also important to make sure that this isn't misused, okay? I have seen this firsthand, okay? If all content is boosted, then quite frankly, effectively no content is boosted. So it does have to be used sparingly. And, and just really, really quickly on this, Daniel, you know, a few things, right? So when you're seeing that an article was engaged by a customer within the case form and they still submitted the case, right? There are a few areas we can look at, whether it's improving the quality of the content, as you were saying, um, and then also looking at some additional capabilities to, um, to better build the bridge between the voice of the customer through synonyms and then also tuning as well. So I think what we'll look at there is um, how, how these components come together to create better findability when it matters most for your customers. To so yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so the knowledge domain experts, first of all, they don't just interact with the knowledge articles. Um, they take a look at the community. And if discussions are not being answered by existing content, uh, then they make sure that content gets created. Okay? Also in the community, if content can be answered by existing, or, or if discussions can be answered by existing content, then providing a link to that content to help customers realize that they can self-service. Okay. Um, looking at which articles get used the most, um, for example, how to and question articles indicates that maybe documentation needs to be updated. Are there topics in blogs that need a knowledge article created that summarizes the blog and then points back to the blog? Okay. Basically, one of the KDE's responsibilities is to take the voice of the customer and make sure the right people within the company are hearing that voice. Um, this includes people like your technical writers, um, your support and success teams, um, your trainers. Our KDEs interact with our uh, training team extensively, okay? Uh, the community teams, and then absolutely the product managers. And we're gonna dive deeper into the product managers here in a bit. Um, so your KDEs have looked at all of this material from all these different sources and have communicated to the appropriate people, right? But users still can't find what they're looking for, all right? Uh, all businesses need to take some time to tune the search engine, right? And it doesn't matter which search engine you're using, Search Unify or some other search engine, you need to take the time to do things like add synonyms add acronyms that are commonly used by your users, right? Now note that I said by your users and not by your employees, okay? Customers, uh, hey, they come up with their own language. They come up with their own ways of referring to things in your product. And so you need to create synonyms for those too. Okay? Another way is to make sure that your did you mean functionality is up to date <clears throat> and also to find common misspellings. Okay, um, and what I mean by that is define common misspellings as synonyms as well as including them in your did you mean functionality, right? Um, I've now worked at two companies that use databases extensively. It is truly mind boggling the number of ways that people can misspell the word database or rearrange the words associated with the database. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that Search Unify has a really nice feature which recommends synonyms uh, based on current customer usage. And I'm actually going to pass this back over to Brian to talk a little bit more about the Search Unify functionality in this area. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Daniel. So, um, you know, in terms of, you know, supervised learning, right, every single time that there is a conversion, we want to understand what, what's the intent behind, behind what the customer was looking for. So what we see, just to finish this slide, is that 
when there are utterances or words used by your customers when they're searching that are nowhere in your list of synonyms, we will tell you what those are and you can make an informed decision whether you want to accept the synonym, accept an abbreviation, or disregard it completely, right? So this way we can continue to funnel those customer insights and then you make the intelligent call in terms of whether this helps reduce customer friction, improve time to value, or whether you should ignore it. Um, in addition to NLP management as well, um, and supervised learning to close the gap, there are, um, there are a few different ways that practitioners like Daniel and Geotab can tune the search results across several different parameters. So if you're looking at you know, traditional keyword-based boosts for best bets, right? trying to put you know, the most relevant article right at the top of the search results, very easy to do. But there's, there's more parameters and levers that you can pull to create the right sort of outcomes for your customers. You can also create um, a hierarchy of content sources and also you know, weight your objects and fields um, to deliver the right, sort of, the right sort of order of search results. Um, so for community practitioners, community practitioners love to promote discussions and um, discussions, KB articles, documentation, oftentimes in that order. For a support portal, it might be completely different. And we also know internally for TSEs and support agents, that could be a different experience altogether. So being able to granularly control search over uh, search tuning over those different interfaces, it's all done with clicks my code. And lastly, where we're, where we're um, seeing a lot of um, momentum from our clients and, and more so from their customers. And as Daniel just highlighted, there's an infinite number of ways to basically say that, you know, to spell database or to, in, in, or in an issue that we see often, describe that you are locked out of your account. I forgot my password, systems offline, wrong username, right? So, if, so we can actually take a, a large group of intents and do tuning based off of that. So this ensures that no matter what the what the, the verbiage is of the verbiage of the customer is, we're connecting them based on what we know about how other users are trying to solve the same problem and making it even easier for them to solve that issue than ever. So Daniel, I think the last thing that we'll one of the last things we'll be jumping into um, as we kind of finish out our, our discussion is leveraging new versus known analysis for driving KB improvement. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to you. Great, thanks. Um, again, just for, co for, uh, for companies that are just starting out on their KCS journey, the new versus known analysis is really important. Um, it's important to take a look at um, uh, the, the ratios that are happening. When you first start, you're going to be creating a lot of content. And so your new content being linked to cases is going to be high. And the known content is actually going to be very low. Then what you should see, if your KCS program is advancing properly, you should see a rapid increase in the amount of known content being linked to cases, and then a gradual decrease in the amount of new content being created and linked to cases. Right? Um, as the program matures, you will reach a norm right, where the ratio doesn't change that much. But this is where tagging can be really important. I referenced this before. When you have new product introductions or big changes to products, um, you should ex expect an increase in the number of new articles being created, especially for a particular domain. So why are we including this in the voice of the customer? Well, basically, if you continue to have a high number of new articles created, then there might be an instability in your product causing issues um, that really need to be addressed. You need to take this information to product management. Uh, these may be functionality, documentation, or usability issues. Um, so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Um, also, link accuracy is super critical to an effective new versus known analysis. Um, Okay, you know, if people aren't linking accurately, you can't measure by measurement or manage by measurement, okay? Um, also, something that most people don't know is that link accuracy also affects the machine learning algorithms that affect your search results, okay? So if your support agents aren't linking correctly, they can actually be improperly skewing the search results. Yeah, abs absolutely. And that's something that, you know, especially, you know, if we're looking at different KCS best practices, even from, um, you know, looking at resolution quality index, you know, that's why that that's so important. Uh, and, you know, Danny, we've talked a lot about, about, you know, understanding, you know, the disconnect in the customer experience, how we can take intelligent action. 
you mentioned something just now about product instabilities and taking that information, packaging that up and, you know, having a collaborative conversation with product management to try and figure out, you know, how we can remove some of these root cause issues. And that'll be the last area that we'll talk about. So um, just given your, you know, your journey, both at Oracle and certainly at Geotab, uh, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you uh, for some perspective on this. Cool. Thanks. Um, so during, uh, I got to tell you that doing a Pareto analysis can, at least at first, be a very time consuming exp uh, experience. Okay? Um, there's a lot of work with spreadsheets, um, manipulating numbers, that type of thing. However, you can apply machine learning to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. All right. Um, so that's something to look at as far as evolving your KDE program. All right. Um, start out working with spreadsheets, kind of get the bugs out and then see if there is something that uh, you can utilize a really good reporting tool or machine learning to help you with this. Um, running a report and getting the curb, well, it only takes you so far, right? On high volume, volume issues, you really need to dig down into the data and find out what's really going on. Uh, machine learning can also help help assist with this. Okay, um, the scatter charts that it produces and the trending analysis. All right, um, these are all uh, beneficial that can be added into your um, root cause analysis, part of your Pareto analysis. All right, now I want to give you a real world example of the benefit of this. Right, when when GeoTab first started doing KCS. It was quickly determined that the absolute biggest pain point for our customers was changing passwords. All right. You might think, okay, that's a no brainer. All right. Um, and quite frankly, convincing product management of this was kind of a difficult thing. So we created a resolution path to handle the various scenarios of when you would need to change your password. And pointed, uh, and that resolution path pointed to the articles that helped the user through each given situation, right? And that decreased the volume of cases being logged a lot. Self-service wise, it was very successful. Okay. Um, go ahead and go to the next, there we go. Um, I gotta tell you, we didn't just stop there, okay? We took that information and we brought it to product management, okay? Product management saw this and went, okay, you're right. And so our products were updated to greatly simplify changing or fixing the password. Our case volume dropped from three to four cases per day, per agent, to three to four cases per month per agent on this issue, okay? An absolutely huge decrease. We literally listened to the voice of the customer and approved our product. Right. That's just one of the cases where this has happened. Right. Now, our product managers are proactive. They review the Pareto analysis every quarter. And I mean the Pareto analysis from each of the KDEs. Okay. And it isn't just our product managers that are utilizing the Pareto analysis. Uh, the people who maintain our help capabilities, we have uh, help interacted, direct, or integrated, there we go, directly with our product. All right. And the people who maintain that help make sure that our customers can have instantaneous access to the answers to the most common questions on how to use any given piece of functionality. And all of this is a result of the Pareto analysis. Now, if you'll bear with me, there's one historic example that I really like to use on this. OK. Um, uh, fellow consortium members may have heard this before, so I apologize to all of you if this is a repeat, okay? But there was a gentleman named Lee Iacocca, and he was a very successful CEO at the Ford Motor Company. Um, frankly, he was the one, he was the one that inspired the Ford Mustang, okay? Um, Chrysler hired him as their CEO because Chrysler was about to go bankrupt. When Mr. Iacocca got to Chrysler, he had a meeting with his vice presidents and he turned to his vice president in charge of warranty work and said, give me a list of your uh, top warranty service requests. And then he took that list and he handed it to the product managers and he said, fix this. Right. 
In that simple way, Lee Iacocca took Chrysler Corporation from bankruptcy to solvency. Now, if you use your KDE program the same way, you can really benefit your company. Okay? The KDEs are your warranty department and they identify the critical pain points for your customers. Now, just like the warranty department, the KDEs are not responsible for telling development how to fix it. Okay? All they do is they just identify the end user pain points and then communicate with the product managers and whoever else in the company so that they can understand the issues and work to solve those problems. Daniel, I absolutely love the example of Lee Iacocca and, and looking at a couple of different examples, uh, whether it's Ford or Chrysler or you know, even DeLorean, even though we know that that didn't exactly go the way it should have. It's, there's just constant innovation and in, in, in thinking about how to, how to put the customer first, you know, even before methodologies like KCF. So I think that that's, that's fantastic. Um, so now we'll just go ahead and, if, Daniel, if you could just uh, give us a, a quick summary in terms of a few of the learnings and takeaways for everybody today, and then we'll go ahead and proceed into a Q&A session for, for the group. Sure. Yes, I can be very verbose. So it's good to summarize things at the end here. Uh, basically, incorporate your customer feedback into the development and maintain, uh, maintenance of your knowledge base. Um, look at the quality and the flow. Look at improving your, your uh, knowledge management through a knowledge management life cycle. Okay. Uh, monitor the reports on key metrics. Uh, there's a lot of business value in the knowledge base. And if you have people that monitor those reports, well, you're uh, managing by measurement. Um, leverage the intelligent technology to perform both new versus known and Pareto analysis, okay? These things are very uh, human resource intensive. And anytime you can apply a tech, uh, technology to help out with that, it's really great. Right? Um, optimize content and the search experience based on, on users, uh, their intent, and their keyword usage. Okay? And also develop a holistic approach to influence the owners of products, um, the documentation people, and the, proce and, uh, the process makers um, to achieve product and process improvements. Okay. Your KDE program can actually save you customers by identifying customer pain points and passing that on so that they can be corrected. Okay. So um, I think that's a pretty good summary. Why don't we go ahead and open it up to Q&A unless you have something else to add, Brian. And you're on. Right. You, you know, I've, I've done a very bad job of uh, staying on mute a few times during the call, but uh, I think you've covered it all, Daniel. I think, uh, you know, your perspective and takeaway and, and really kind of even how you think about the KDEs, right? So, I mean, so many times we think about a solo KDE and it doesn't have to be that way. So I think there's some really interesting perspective that you shared today. And, you know, for anybody in the consortium, you can certainly reach out to Daniel or, you know, or myself and we'll be glad to answer any questions on the side. Arnfin, let me go ahead and toss it back over to you and see if there are any live questions that we can help. Yeah, and please, again, post your questions, Chad. There's, there's a lot of great uh, advanced topics, a lot of lessons learned through the, the decades. And, and I did post in chat, we did come up with a, actually post it one more time. Um, we did come up with a uh, KDA guide. And I think that would be very helpful for folks. Is that in an hour, they touched on so many great topics. Um, and then with that KDA guide, it really has that foundational where that might be helpful for some where the KDA, KDE and KDA knowledge domain analysis, KDE knowledge domain expert, um, where that might be new. Um, encourage you to take a look at that guide. Um, and then again, might want to review the uh, this recording too. Again, this is going to be uh, live for everybody and that might set some of the, the foundation for you. And then uh, that's so great that you're willing to, both of you are willing to answer questions there. But any questions that others um, would like to bring up right now? And, oh, great, thank you. And please also, given we do have a little bit of time, if uh, I, I see in the uh, chat, many are, are new on the KD, uh, KDE journey. Um, so it sounds like this was very helpful. If others have been doing it for a while, 
love to hear your experiences too. So feel free to, to jump in if uh, you want to reinforce any of the points that uh, you, that really resonated with you or, um, or anything like that. Yeah, especially since um, uh, RKDA, RKDE program is rather a unique setup. I'd like to hear how other people have it. Daniel, just a question for you. How did you figure that out? You know, that you could, you could kind of deputize KDEs, for example. Like, where, where, where was the thought process on that? <laughs> uh, quite frankly, um, are you, one thing about your KDEs is they are your top people. OK, and your top people are being asked to do a lot of different things. And so if you can pull some of the more repetitive, almost mundane work, like handling feedback away from them and and uh, is divide and conquer and move that off to another group that is quite qualified to handle it, but maybe not quite so busy. Like, for example, our deputy KDEs, they're generally on the night shift. And so they have they have a lot of time to dedicate to this kind of stuff. So it was just working through the roadblocks that we encountered and finding solutions for them. And there was a great question in chat on the uh, full time job or not. I know most uh, KDEs are actually part time. Um, some have a, a combination of full time as well as uh, part time. But you want to discuss that? Uh, what percentage of the time your deputy? KDEs and product KDEs spend on the KDE activity? Okay. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, again, um, we might be a little bit unique in this because our KDEs almost exclusively have engineering degrees, right? And so that's what they like to focus on. And they, for the most part, they don't want to do KDE work full time. And so that's why they, focus more on the analytics side, um, which requires uh, a, a, about two weeks of work throughout the quarter, okay? Um, there's usually a crunch right towards the time when the Pareto analysis is due. Part of that is simply because people procrastinate, okay? Our KDEs are, are normal that way. Um, uh, and then the, uh, the deputy KDEs, uh, they spend about um, two hours a week working on the uh, feedback and looking at the long tail and looking for duplicates and, and that type of thing, answering questions, okay? Um, and then our uh, process and procedure KDs is strictly on demand. Uh, they really don't do a Pareto analysis. However, they do other KDE work like creating resolution guides and that type of thing. So hope that uh, if... I hope that answered your question. If not, I can clarify some more. Yeah, that's great. And then and, and just to expand on that, most companies do have, again, to keep those, the, as Daniel mentioned, they need to be the experts. And if you take them out as, and as full-time, then they lose that. And it's, uh, it's kind of a lose-lose in that they don't like to lose their expertise. And then they're not as uh, valuable in that role. And so just as we have uh, the coaches, being the peers and, and part-time, same thing with the KDA. We found that it works out in most companies, works out very, very well to keep them maintaining their technical expertise and while at the same time um, spending some time here. Um, uh, and Arnf and I see there was actually a second part to that question and that was about a career path. Yeah, that'd be um, great. Yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting that you bring that up because these are your, your overachievers anyway. Okay. And so what other people see is they see this person doing things like going above and beyond. It's not part of their job description to be a KDE. Okay. But they do it anyway, because they're interested in KCS. Yes, they understand the value of it. And so, and then those people get promoted to being team leads or managers or um, advanced engineers, okay? uh, move into the development side, that type of thing. And when they see, when other people in the company see that happening, um, then they want to uh, make themselves to the level where they would be considered part of the KDE program. And people do have to interview for the KDE position. It's not just something that, uh, that is just given out if somebody wants it, so. And we did, uh, you talked about so many different uh, tools. Um, 
both uh, analytics that GeoTab, I imagine your group is providing to those KDEs as well as leveraging um, Search Unify and, and others. Um, there was a question on there's, you always have the good, better, best um, with a, having advanced analytics versus where do you get started? Um, and, and certainly as you've highlighted, analytics is so key. So providing that to the KDEs rather than them having to create their own reporting. Any recommendations there on some of the just ways to get started if you don't have machine learning and, and some of those advanced tools? Yeah, so um, to start out with, like for example, um, our uh, software that we use for um, doing cases, um, there was data collected there and then also Google Analytics. Um, we, we could see which articles were being used and through linking, we could see which articles were being linked to cases. And so we extracted that data from, from three different sources, quite frankly, into Excel spreadsheets and then used uh, those spreadsheets um, to combine the data, all right? Which, and uh, so which meant we had to find a commonality between all three sources, combine that data and then work with it. All right. Then what we did is once we kind of got the process refined a little bit, what we did is we had all that data from those three different sources imported into our BigQuery database. And so now the database actually does a lot of work. Um, the KDEs literally go fill in the, the uh, uh, filters that they want, um, the, the, like, for example, the time frame and the uh, domains that they want to look at, the data categories they want to look at, and it generates the reports for them, including drill downs to the cases uh, where articles were linked. So and so that greatly simplified it, and it it was um, it took some time uh, because we had to justify the effort of importing all that data into our BigQuery database as well. So. Great, right. thanks for that. There was, uh, Eric had a uh, very tactical, but very uh, important question I think a lot uh, run into as far as expiration dates on articles. Some of the tools, knowledge management tools uh, require an expiration date on that. How do you deal with that? Um, do you have that as a, actually a requirement in your environment? I tried where... downloading the app and it said that. Oh, I'm sorry? Oh, oh okay. Oh. Maybe somebody just didn't have their <laughs> mute on. Okay, um, so do me a favor. Uh, can you repeat the question there, Ernfin? Yeah, so some of the tools um, for the article have a, uh, an expiration date. It's that is automatic in there. And then it'll automatically archive in that expiration date. And so when you have a KDE and you wanna really trust them to manage that and not the system, um, any workarounds there if your system has that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, uh, okay, so I've seen this done two different ways. Okay, one is that uh, a list is generated for the KDEs to respond, and if they don't respond to it, then after a certain amount of time, then the article gets archived automatically. Okay, um, we're not really to that trust point yet with our system, and so uh, everything will be reviewed by the deputy KDEs. Uh, and, um, then, uh, any, any questions that they have, they will pass on to the product KDEs. But one thing that's important too, is companies have products that maybe they're not selling anymore, but they still have to support. And so it's important to create, um, a list, um, so that those articles basically never get archived, even though they fully meet the archival, um, qualifications. And I think that, yeah, that, that's awesome. And then the key takeaway there is it's really, is the value of the article, not the age of the article that really drives archiving. And so if some of the systems are based in on, on age, really looking more as, as you talked about, how valuable is it? Um, and whether it be used by the uh, customers, used by your agents or a very critical product that is still there that you wanna make sure you have that knowledge available. So thank you for that. And I know uh, Ben's been in there answering quite a few. Are there others, Ben, that you uh, would like to bring up in the chat that you've seen that you haven't been able to answer? 
Yeah, we had a question about um, in the absence of smart tools, such as machine learning and domain analysis reporting, are there any other KDE activities uh, that you'd like to highlight rather than uh, or in addition to a Pareto analysis? Okay, um, so one thing is the KDEs need to share lessons learned with each other. Um, we have a we have a biweekly uh, KDE meeting and where we talk about what the KDEs are doing and also the KDEs uh, watch each other's presentations, right? Um, but I think I've pretty much covered all of the activities that our KDEs do. Uh, the really the critical point is to convince KDEs that they can actually influence the company, okay? that they actually have that much power. OK, um, another uh, there is another aspect to the KDEs is they are KCS evangelists. OK, um, they are the ones they if there's a coach that that um, uh, might need some might need a pep talk, we might connect them with a KDE. Um, we have a particular KDE that, <laughs> uh, quite frankly, the consortium should hire him because he is just <laughs> he's just such an advocate of the KCS program, and um, uh, he will quite often talk to managers and go to team meetings and that type of thing to evangelize KCS and, and really drive home uh, how valuable the KCS program is. So, um, other than what I talked about, I think that's probably the major activity of the of the KDEs that I really didn't cover. Yeah, and that's such a great point, uh, Daniel, on them being the promoters. Oftentimes, the knowledge workers and even the coaches aren't seeing all the value that the KCS activities are bringing in. So, not only driving that with product management, but bringing that back into support to say, look at the value and your example of the uh, the cases uh, for the. Uh, changing passwords, et cetera, and how it went from two to three a day to two to three a, uh, a month per agent and sharing some of those stories. It really gets uh, people excited about that. So having them as evangelists within your service organizations is so key. So thanks for highlighting that. And we're actually timing out now. So um, what we are going to be doing, again, we'll have a uh, We'll send this out as well as the presentation. They did an incredible job on the presentation, all the, the slides and graphics and such. So we'll have that out uh, to you all and uh, really appreciate everyone's participation and appreciate all the, the great work. So thanks to Search Unify and Geotab. And you all have a great rest of the day.